Hello, Brother Elisha. Good, 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 good. Afternoon, morning. Yeah. How are you, sir? Yeah. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you, sir? Great, great, great. Great to see you. I hope your, your weekend was good. Yes, sir. Excellent, excellent. All right, we're going to pray and start. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, Sister Jenny. Bless you. Shall we pray and begin in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus? Father, I pray that today, through the study of your word, we shall be filled with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that we shall walk worthy of the Lord according to the rank and file that you've made us. As we are fruitful in every good work, and as we increase in the knowledge of God the Father, so that we shall be strong with all might according to your glorious power in our inner personality, and to all patience, with long suffering, with joyfulness, as this will cause us to overflow with joyfulness, as we give thanks to you, as we understand that you have made us qualified to be a partaker of the inheritance in the saints in the light. We give you all the glory for today. And Father, take authority over every activity of Satan and deny him access in our minds. And Father, I allow the light of Christ to shine so bright in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let me take this wonderful, wonderful opportunity to welcome all of you to this Monday morning, the 21st of September, 2020 edition of Epic Gnosis Day. Whoa! This is a joy. And once again, it comes to you from the quarters of Full Gospel Church International, the London branch, Christ Revealed Center. And it is a joy to come your way. Me, your host, Pastor Fred Abeka, and Lady Patience Abeka, and all the wonderful faithfuls of FGCI London branch. For your information, the song that plays in the background for wherever this recording will go to, uh, we don't have any copyright claim to it. It is just for the pure purpose of the teaching. Also, I'll say that get ready with your pens and your notebooks, um, wherever you are, if you are not able to do it. Anyway, remember that the recording is available also um, on our YouTube website. I'm looking at the statistics on the YouTube website, and I must say that for me, it comes as a little surprise, you know, um, that the total number of subscriptions so far is getting close to 30. But when I go there, I realize that sometimes the total views are five, six, seven, okay? And I, I did a little bit of trace work and I realized that um, there are some people who are not able to come here consistently because of the nature of their work. And then they are the ones that go there. But what I want to advise to you, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like, I mean, sort of um, irascible or anything like that, but I'm just saying that, you know, the word of God, you cannot listen to it once. It's not possible. You, you cannot listen to it once and think that you grasp it. You know, that, that, that <laughs> it, can never, it, can, it can never be like that. And if you don't listen to it consistently, when you meet somebody and you want to explain, you forget everything just go out of the window. So you have to keep on, you know, cementing it in your mind, in your mind, in your mind, in your mind. Then you, you become very confident with it. In that regard, you know, praise the name of the living God. All right, so let us continue. We are getting very close to the end of this big segment of what the forgiveness of sins is. If after this segment, you are still not clear about the forgiveness of sins, then I really, really wonder, seriously. So that's why I've taken my time. The word of God is not for rush. The word of God is for explanation. Right, so let us continue in our study and once again focus we are continuing on our segment what is the forgiveness of sins and look at that lesson number 50 lesson number 58 rather 
lesson number 58. Absolutely mesmerizing. 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 Let's take our anchor Bible verse. Luke chapter 24, verse 44 to 47. Then he said to them, Jesus said to the eleven, this is what I told you while I was still with you. That means that he was trying to communicate something to them. That is everything which has been already written about me, but they couldn't see it. In the law of Moses, the writings of Moses, and the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Forty-five. Then he opened their minds, a first time here, to help them understand. Now, that, 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 that verse 45, you know, it, 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 it blows my mind. Because so since, <laughs> since Moses wrote from Genesis all the way to Malachi, even though these guys were reading, these Jewish guys were reading it and, and, and reciting it and knowing it by heart, the first five book of Moses plus the prophets and the Psalms, they never understood that it referred to Jesus. They never understood it. And when we come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they still did not understand it. Ow, man, ouch. That is something they didn't understand. So he's trying to let us know that the focus of the Old Testament writings is on Christ. And so I always stress, if you use the Old Testament to teach anything, you have gone off course. Now, it, will sound, it can sound good. It can sound good. It can sound very, very good. But you are outside the syllabus. Because when you begin to preach the Old Testament and you begin to separate them and single out, you know, Gideon, and you single out Jehoiada, you single out Jehu, what you make the whole thing look like, that it, it does not take account of what we have in Christ now. All of a sudden, we have, we have blanketed Christ, what he has done for us, and we are looking at Gideon, who was not born again, who was under law and had to perform. Then all of a sudden, it leaves you with the impression that, ah, if Gideon um, could not do ABC, then I cannot do it, so I am limited. Can you see where that is going now? See that? So all of a sudden, we have forgotten that it is about what Christ did. That is why he said, it is about me. If it is not about Jesus, you are, of course, ouch, sorry. Somebody says, so can we not preach Solomon? Jesus himself said in the book of Matthew that Solomon, in all his glory, that is the highest pinnacle that Solomon reached, he said, yet he was not arrayed or in other words, his glory, what he achieved, cannot be compared to the lilies of the field. You know what a lily is? A lily is a type of flower. Ha! And yet, we pride in Solomon's wisdom. Then he continued, he said, but a greater than Solomon is here. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, Solomon's wisdom, when you put it in the light of the finished work of Christ, is a cake. Because Solomon's wisdom in Proverbs, where they were, they were, if you study very well, he picked it up from the writings of Moses. So they were what we call probability. In other words, let me summarize Proverbs, Proverbs for you. That means, what it means is that if everything was perfect and had not Adam sinned, then what I write in Proverbs will hold water. That is what you're trying to say. So that it, was, it, was, it was a probability. Like, for example, Proverbs 31 woman. There is no Proverbs 31 woman. What Solomon was saying was that in a perfect world where there is no sin, where, there, where politics, economics, everything is lined up, then it is so. But we know that it cannot be possible. So it was, it was an assumption. It was a probability. So when Jesus said that he opened their minds, yeah, that means that they all lost the focus of the central theme of the writings of the Old Testament and including the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because that's why he came. So the answers are in the epistles. The believer is superior to Samson. 
is superior to Moses, the believer. See, but we, our, have you seen, have you seen where all our, our preaching comes from? Everything, Moses. Everything, Gideon. Everything, Elijah. Elisha. <laughs> have, you, have you seen? We are, the Bible even says in Hebrews chapter 11, the last verse, it said, it said, without us, they were not made perfect. Without us. The body of Christ after resurrection. So how can that be my model? So he said that then he opened their minds to help them to help them understand the Old Testament, what, they, what it, it was talking about. And so it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance necessary for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So, so far, we have said that forgiveness of sins in Luke 24 that we just read was based on the Greek word aphesis which means complete removal, such that no, nothing exists to which you can use to charge to the man who has believed's account. And in the Old Testament, they used the word hilaskomai, which had to do with only the actions or sinful behavior, but not the nature. So the actions were covered, but the nature was not dealt with. Okay, so please take note that in the light of how Jesus taught on the, on the subject of forgiveness of sins in Luke 24, as a pattern from which the apostles explained it in the same way. Then we, this is where we ended last week, the whole of last week. 1 John 1, 9 is the only Bible verse that brought in the concept of confession of sins practiced under the law in the epistles, the only. So 1 John 1, 9, if we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he's faithful and just through his own nature and promises and will forgive our sins and cleanse us continually from all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness to be without Christ. Our wrongdoing, everything not in conformity with his will and purpose. So we say that it would be fallacious to jump to conclusions based on a single verse and make a doctrine or, or a practice to it. We already established that. So 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 is the paradigm model for interpreting everything in the epistles and the word of God. This is the third time I'm visiting you. Every fact shall be sustained and confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses written. So the moment anybody quotes a Bible verse and wants to allude to something, whether it says you can lose your salvation, whatever it is, whatever practice it is, if it is mentioned once, it is not a doctrinal practice that the apostles lay down. I want that one to sing because I'm telling you, if you understand this, your Bible reading will be very easy. At least 80% of the difficulty is removed. But if you don't accept this, then that one you're on your own. There's nothing I can do. I'm, doing, I'm, doing, I'm helping you out. So anytime you read something, ask yourself, where else is this repeated in the epistles? Why the epistles? Because the epistles are the revelation of all that was in the Old Testament. So ask yourself, is it repeated in the book I'm reading? So if I read something like, I'm just giving an example. It doesn't exist, but I'm giving an example. Like washing of feet. Then maybe I'm, I'm just giving an example. I mean, let, let me say I saw washing of feet, of feet in the Gospels, in Jesus. Now the next thing I need to do is that, where else was it practiced? It was recorded once. Then let me come now to the epistles, which are our syllabus. Then go through, go through Romans, go through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go through all that, all the way to Jude. See if you can see any of it repeated there. If you don't see repeated there, then it means he is not writing it for us as a practice. It was a custom that was done within that historical context. Do you understand this? this? This is absolutely pivotal, I'm telling you. If you don't know this, anybody with eloquence can come and twist the word. So let that stay with you. And, 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 and I don't care what topic it is, and I don't care how long it has been practiced. We are, we are helping. So that begins to throw some light in some areas, which I'll deal with later. For example, even communion. 
<laughs> Communion is Passover. It's a Jewish practice. We shall deal with it later and see what, what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Whether was he talking about communion as a practice or was he talking about communion as a historical context? And what did he mean? What do we mean by breaking bread? Is breaking bread communion? Is breaking bread communion? Hey! So we're investing. So you have to use that to guide you. It doesn't matter on any subject. That is the way you see it. That's why Paul said he borrowed it from Deuteronomy twice, from Matthew, Jesus, and he repeated it. That's the way the, the Jews deal, dealt with everything. Two or three, in legal matters, in death, in custom, and in, in, in doctrine. So you cannot just quote Bible. That's why I said that the Bible is not about quoting. Do you understand what you are quoting? Do you know how it fits in the whole book or the whole chapter or the whole chapters? When you quote a Bible verse, do you, do you know how it, it fits or sits with the rest of the chapters? Or you are just quoting or you are quoting sentimentally, or you are not being teachable. It's a very serious matter. So we have already established in past studies that before apostles accepted any Bible verse to be considered as a consistent practice, it must have been mentioned more than twice in a particular book in the epistles or mentioned consistently throughout all the letters of the apostles. And when you do this mathematical paradigm, you notice that what stood out more in all the letters of the apostles was what, what, was what Christ has done for us already. It's amazing. I'm, I'm surprised that, oh, I mean, I've been a believer for so many years, since 1981. I've listened and I've watched. I've listened, I've watched from, and I'm not knocking anybody. I'm not mentioning anybody's name. But I've, I've listened cross board. I am a voracious reader. I am a voracious researcher. I've listened across board. I've listened to God's channel. I've listened to premier radio. I've been to conferences. I, it looks like our emphasis is not even on what we have received in Christ. Always the preaching always ends with something like, we have not yet arrived. We are still trying to go. We are still on our way. We have not yet arrived. But the apostles never preached. You watch all the teachings of the apostles. Everything was in the past tense. They emphasized that, it is a completed reality that is available to you now, not tomorrow. And they spoke more of what we have in Christ. They spoke more of what we have in Christ. More. There's not a single mention of generational curses. None. They spoke more of what we have in Christ. There's, I mean, when it comes to even the area of practice of sins, I can show you all the Bible verses where they spoke about it. In percentage, comparatively, it was even less. So the big gap that we have today is that there is not enough teaching on what we have in Christ. When a believer knows who they are in Christ, you don't even have to worry about him. He'll be fine. He will be fine. He will be fine. So that is how you look at it. Ask yourself that question. When anybody preaches and brings anything, whether he's preaching on um, firstborn, the mystery of the firstborn, the, all those kind of teachings. When they close, please, with us here, walk to the front of the church. Say, hello, sir. Sorry, sorry, sir. Can I see you one minute? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you said something in the preaching. Um, I, I, I just want to be clear. Can you please show me where it is in the epistles or where you saw it two or three times or where, as Jesus practiced it and the apostles practiced it? You will see, you, you listen to the answer that he'll give you, or she will give you. None. Let us pray for open heavens. Where? Christ is the open heavens. You have been made to sit together in Christ. Where? In the heavenlies. In Christ. So in Christ, heaven is open 24-7, 365, 366 in a leap year. That shop is never closed. Show me where the apostle said, bring me 61 pounds and 20 pence. So that it to be Psalm 61 verse 20, so that God will make that promise come to Show me where. Show me where. So until we learn these things, 
and we stay stay with the stay with the framework stay with it don't go by angelic appearance and god appear to me no stay with this so that's the whole chapter of first john must be examined as it appears to differ in style and approach first john one seemed not to follow the epistle style where on all the epistles they establish the believers' eternal salvation first, then followed by spiritual growth or conduct. Now, having understood the above, now I'm going to go, I'm going to switch now. Having understood the above, we can make deductions regarding forgiveness of sins in two clear areas. Old Testament, including Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Under these dispensations, conditions were to be met before the the sins of men could be forgiven. However, it was their sinful, it was their sinful acts that were covered, but the Adamic sin nature penalty was not settled. New Testament after resurrection adds to revelation. Under this era, forgiveness is squarely based on the sacrifice of Jesus as our substitute, not you. Thus, Remission of forgiveness of sin and sins is a gift and it is a message which is explained to be preached, believed upon, and received. The Father made the reconciliation through Christ. It's a serious fact. When you know this, Bible study is a breeze. So far, we have settled the following before I jump into today's one. Sin as a nature that produces the attitude of sinful behavior. Sin as a nature brought by Adam introduced spiritual death, mortality, and eternal death way before sinful behavior was identified by the law. Therefore, the sin of Adam is the greatest sin because it was that singular action that produced death. The sin of Adam was unbelief, which was tantamount to high treason. The sin of Adam is spiritual death, which is a nature or the DNA of the devil. Adam was united with Satan, according to Ephesians chapter 2. God in his love had to bring in a temporary measure to allow man to still be able to approach him. This was what was introduced, this is what introduced the system of animal sacrifice before the law from Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus chapter 12. Then from Exodus chapter 12 to Malachi, which is the period of the law, more requirements like confession of sins and the day of atonement was included. Man had to perform to be accepted. The same applies to the period of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, known as the Synoptic Gospels. However, in the epistles, Jesus explained in Luke 24 that none of those demands were no longer required. All a man had to do was to believe that Jesus had fulfilled all those requirements as our substitute. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, that Christ is the end of the law. We also settled that 1 John 1 9 was not written to the believer in Christ, but it was written to hardened Jewish unbelievers called Gnostics. In the epistles, God had decided it is his decision whether you jump up and down, whether you become sentimental, will not change this fact. God has decided not to charge any sin to the believer's account because the nature of sin has been removed. Therefore, any sinful act is not counted. The believer, therefore, what they should he do? Therefore, appreciates, that is why he said, you must teach this, the facts and the epistles. The believer, therefore, appreciates this reality as an act of gratitude in faith. So the facts of this understanding must be anchored believers his mind, but accurate knowledge found throughout the epistles and by consistently praying 
the anointed prayers found in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, and Philemon 1 6. So now, based on that, I want us to look at something that the apostle did, which I'll deal with a few days here. And it is also very climatic as we come, we bring this segment of teaching to a close. I want us now to look at an exegetical expose of Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6 in the light of how sins are forgiven in the epistles. Because the way I hear some believers talk about sins, they make it look like grace is weak. Then they label grace as hyper grace is the biggest insult. Grace is not only hyper. <laughs> it is double hyper. The word hyper means abundant. Didn't Jesus Christ say, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So why are you calling grace hyper? These hyper grace, these hyper grace Christians. You are displaying your ignorance in plain broad light. So for me, before I will listen to a man, I want to hear him teach on salvation. And I want to hear him teach on the forgiveness of sins. If those two, he cannot, he cannot decode it, forget it. The rest that will come, I know error will follow. I know error will follow. It will not be long. So let us look at Romans chapter 5. Because the way, we, the way our messages centers more on sin, on sin, on faults, on faults, on faults, and a tiny bit is alluded to grace. In fact, we make grace look like, we make grace look like something like, oh, you know, it's just in person, but that is not the main deal. But my prayer for you is that you will make heaven. <laughs> so let us look at how Paul dealt with it. It appears that in looking at Romans, the book of Romans is our empirical, hermeneutical, exegetical expose, proving beyond doubt, the believer can never lose their salvation. And that there is no sin against the believer. We just take portions out. So we need to do the combo. So let us look at Romans chapter 5. Once again, you cannot understand Romans chapter 5. Because the argument started in Romans chapter 3. But I will not start from there. But he carried it on to chapter 4. So let us look at the latter part of Romans chapter 4. Then we'll come to Romans chapter 5. The way Paul wrote it, Romans chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10. He was trying to see us that, let us know that what Christ did is far outrageously far bigger than any sin. And the believer has broken away completely from anything that is called sin, even though he might exhibit sinful attitudes. But it is not counted to his account. Religious people can handle this. It's not our fault. It's the way that this attention to detail was not seen. So let's look at Romans chapter 4, 13. Watch. Once again, once again, what you must bring to me, he's bringing Abraham. He's bringing Abraham. If you think that it was rather after the law that God decided to bring in the promise, you are wrong. So his, his argument was that, think of Abraham. How can Abraham be called righteous? Was, it, was he called righteous when he was circumcised? No. Before circumcision. Number two, Abraham, was he perfect in all his actions? No. When he was called righteous, did he stay perfect? No. He lied twice to Abimelech. Did that change anything? No. So he brings Abraham as our model. Watch. The, the promise of faith versus keeping the law. Because that is a contention that many are still preaching. You preach all this, you teach all this, 58 lessons. Then they say, eh, yes, but you see, you know, um, the believer, you see, you cannot, you cannot preach this, you cannot be sinning, sinning. You see, when, when people say that, then I know that, I don't, so I don't even argue with them. I just I know where they are coming from. They have not understood the principle. They have not understood the exegesis. They have not understood it clearly. It's not clear in their mind. 
So the person will need to be humble and say, look, I really don't understand. Explain to me. Then we travel. Promise of faith, the message versus keeping the law. Which one holds supremacy? Romans 4, 13. God promised Abraham. Now that word promise, mili la 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 la. Let me just do a little bit of work on that one. The word promised is the Greek word epangelia. Huh. Oh my goodness me. Let me correct something. Let me correct something. God did not make a covenant with Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham, but later did a covenant to seal it and let him see whether, to give him a picture representation of the promise. God, listen to me, God did not make a promise to Abraham. God did not make a covenant with Abraham. No, he made a promise to Abraham, but he gave him a picture representation of that promise with a covenant action. Let me say this one, number two. We don't have a covenant with God. No. We are products of the covenant that God made with Jesus. Ha! Are you, are you in covenant with your, your father and mother? Are you in covenant with your father and mother? No, you are not. Who has the covenant? It's your father and mother that made vows and they made a covenant to themselves on the marriage day. Who are, who are the children? You are byproducts. The result of the, the production of that covenant are the children. So the children, what do they do? Do the children come and ask? No, they just go to the fridge and take what they want because in their mind, they know that you two are responsible for them. Whatever, whatever they do does not nullify the relationship between your husband and wife. They are yours forever. And they have a right to the entitlement of it. We do not have a covenant with God. Hear me, it's not a slip of tongue. That's what he's trying to explain. We do not have a covenant with God. We, have, we, are, the, we are byproducts. We are benefactors of the covenant that God has with Jesus. <laughs> So God does, did not have a covenant with Abraham. You have to read it well in Galatians chapter 3. He made a promise to Abraham. And to give him a picture, like a receipt, is when he made him to do the circumcision. And he let him have a deep sleep and slaughtered two animals and put the blood in between. And, and a smoking furnace went in between as Abraham fell in a deep sleep. What you're saying is that even though we have done this, I am responsible for that promise. That is the word promise. A promise means a self-fulfilling word, a pangelia. Self-fulfilling. It doesn't need your help. It doesn't need my help. It will take place by the progenitor of it. So God promised Abraham and his descendants that they will have an heir who will reign over the world. I'm using passion translation because, because this is technical, I chose this translation so our understanding will be clear. This royal promise was not fulfilled because Abraham kept all the law. But through the righteousness that was transferred by faith, 14, for if keeping the law ends inheritance, he said, if by keeping the law, you can get the inheritance, the things that God has promised, then faith is robbed of its power. And the promise becomes useless because the promise preceded the law. That is why I kept on saying that the plan of God concerning salvation came before the law. So the New Testament was in a shadow in what God told Abraham. The New Testament is older than the Old Testament. Because the New Testament is the original plan. But the, the, the Old Testament came to interrupt it because of the sinful multiplication of man's behavior. So the original plan is this that he's discussing with Abraham. He's bringing your mind to it. He said, for if keeping the law 
earns the inheritance. The faith is robbed of its power and the promise becomes useless. Then we don't need a promise. Verse 15, for the law provokes punishment. And where no law exists, there cannot be a violation of the law. That's, that's self-explanatory. 16, the promise depends on faith. Now, that word faith there is not faith pistis as a tool to get something from God. No. Remember, watch the construction. Watch the construction. Promise, self-fulfilling, depends on faith. The faith now is what? It's the word faithfulness. What faithfulness? The faithfulness of the promise in God. God is the one who will fulfill it. He only needed a human vehicle because man had authority in planet Earth so that through that Jesus will come. That is all he required. That is why he walked to Abraham. And that is why he saluted Abraham because Abraham with no evidence said, yes, sir, I am ready to be, allow myself to be a vehicle through which that promise will come. That is why Jesus, God just clapped for Abraham. He said, ma, 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 ma. <laughs> an idol worshiper, an unbeliever, my goodness. Ah, you have surprised me. What? How can you know this? So when he says the promise depends on faith, not you. It's the faithfulness of Christ that he will do it so that it can be experienced as a gift, a grace gift. And now it extends to all the descendants of Abraham. This promise is not only meant for those who obey the law, but also those who enter the faith of Abraham or who emulate the father of us all. Verse 17, that's what the scripture means when it says, I have made you the father of many nations. What he meant was that I have made this your action. This your action. The great model of many nations to come. Jews and Gentiles. He is our example and father. For in God's presence, he believed that God can raise the dead. Hi, yeah, 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 yeah. And call into beings things that even do not exist yet. How did Abraham factor into the resurrection of Christ? My, 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 my. 18, against all odds, when he looked hopeless, Abraham believed that the promise and pro, believed the promise and expected God to fulfill it. He took God at his word. And as a result, he became the father of many nations. God's declaration over him came to pass. Your descendants will be so many. Now, wait, oh, wait, 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 wait before, wait before you, you jump, because I've heard it preach that they are referring to Israel. No, no. That is not, that is, that's not where God's eye was. God's eye was not on Israel. Hebrews gives us the answer that he may bring many sons to glory. The many sons are the ones who believe the message, Jews and Gentiles. That is what he's talking about. Not biological descendants. He used the biological descendants as a picture that a time will come as Israel will extend like that, so I have spiritual sons and daughters, not only of Israel, but from the Gentile world as well, in addition. So in Ephesians, he talks about the fact that, he said, we are no longer aliens, strangers outside the commonwealth of Israel, but we are of the very household of God, his very members. This came to us, that has been fulfilled in Christ. So in spite of being nearly 100 years old, when the promise of having a son was made, his faith was so strong, blessed Abraham, Matataya, that it could not be undermined by the fact that he and Sarah were incapable of conceiving a child. So the barrenness of Sarah was a metaphor of the death and the burial of Christ. Because Isaiah 53 says that he grew up out of the ground out of a barren ground, like a dry shoot. That that looks an impossible tax. Sarah were incapable of conceiving a child. 22 to 20, 20 to 21. He never stopped believing God's promise. So Abraham looked further. Let me tell you, if you read Hebrews, Abraham was not looking to Canaan. No. That is why his name has been recorded consistently. He said he looked, for a, he looked for a country, Hebrews, whose foundations 
and architect is God. He got there. As they traveled, he realized that it was not, it was not, it was not the place. No. And because he was mighty in faith, that word mighty in faith means that, means that at the first instance, when God told him of the promise, he just got what God was talking about. That is why God wanted to see whether Abraham, you and I, are we on the same page? Are, are you thinking of Isaac? Are you thinking of Israel? Or you know I'm talking about a Messiah. Bring your son Isaac. Let me, let, me see if, let me see if the lessons I've given you, you understand. So when Abraham took the knife, then God said, oh, so you know that I, I can, even if Isaac goes, there's a, there's a resurrection. Cool. We are on the same page. We are on the same page. He's not saying bring money. Then he said, bring your only Isaac. No, he wanted him to see whether the message was preaching to him in, in a figure, whether Abraham got the message, which we call it, are we on the same page? Like your lecturer is, is talking, he's talking, and then say, are we on the same page? Are, are, are we on the same wavelength? That's what he did. So Abraham saw beyond. He said, Abraham saw my day. He said, and because he was mighty in faith and convinced that God had all the power needed to fulfill his promises, Abraham glorified God. So now you can see why Abraham's faith was credited to his account as righteousness before God. So the word righteousness means that God decided to treat him as a believer, that he will not count his sins against him and give him right of approach and right status and privilege without God's spirit being inside him, which was reserved for us who come after resurrection. Verse 23, and this declaration was not just spoken over Abraham, but also over us. That means it was because it was extended. It was us he was thinking about. For when we believe and embrace the one who brought our Lord Jesus back to life, you see that the apostles will always link it to resurrection. Perfect righteousness will be credited to our account as well. So I've never seen Jesus before. I was not there on Golgotha. I was not there in Gethsemane. But when they preached me the gospel, that is, that is, that is believing. That means, can I trust God in Christ? That is part of it. That is part of it. That I don't have any physical evidence. But I will take a risk and believe that when I, give my, when I receive what you have done, you will never count sin against me. That is the promise. That is the promise. You will never count sin against me. Can I trust you, God? You are preaching to me through this brother, this sister. Can I? So you see how wrong it is when you go to evangelism and you go and bash. You are a homosexual. You are this. God is angry against you. That is not the message. So now let us not come. Now having said that, let us see how it joins to Romans chapter 5. So now Paul is saying that if you understand what I said about Abraham, because that was the argument of, with the Roman Christians, the Jews there, that what are you saying? Ah, you Paul, so this temple that took us 46 years to build and all these rituals and all that, you Paul, you are saying that, you are saying that all I do is to believe on Jesus and I'm cool. Ah, it's the same thing we think today. Ah, Pastor Fred. So are you saying, I'm not saying, the word is saying, that, so I'm born again, no matter what I do, I can't lose my savior. Exactly. That's the argument. Paul. That's what Paul is trying to clear. Romans 5 verse 1. Our faith in Jesus, so our faith is in Jesus' faithfulness of the promise that he made to Abraham transfers God's righteousness to us and now he declares us, can you see that word? Let, let me rub my eyes. Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> hey, eh? Since you received Jesus, look, look at that word. Look at it. Let me put it in red. From the day you received Jesus, he declares you flawless in his sight. <laughs> Against the nations. Why? This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God. That means, I say it all the time, there is nothing between you and God again. Because when you think like that, that, that slows you down. See, when you think that mm, there's something, uh, there's something maybe because I've done something wrong. So now you begin to link it with even your performance at work, link it to your progress in life, link it, even link it to what you want to do. 
oh, I want to do this, but you see, because of this, maybe God is angry with me saying, maybe I might not really be able to build a house because favor, there will be no favor. Then somebody who doesn't understand what I'm saying will go and quote the book of Proverbs. He said, this means we can now, not tomorrow, since the day we see Jesus, enjoy true lasting peace with God. All because of what our Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one, has done for us. Accept this and don't struggle with this. Leave those religious teachings that we had in the past. We all we didn't know. Let the word speak for itself. And these things were more in all of Paul's writing than these things of sins we talk about. The believer, God has nothing against the believer. He's not even, he, he doesn't even register. There is no record of it. To him, we are flawless in his sight. Whether you have got Peruvian hair or not, whether you have got Brazilian hair or not, your identity, I'm glad that the one in heaven sees me flawless. Whether your, your relatives see you, do not see you that way or not, I am glad that the master of the universe is the only person who will not see any flaw in me. Praise God. Praise God. They might have insulted you since you were a child, but when you receive Jesus, it cancels all that. It doesn't matter. He says, you are flawless in his eyes. Ha! You tell yourself, as for me, I'm never able to get to work on time. So you see that as a flaw. You are flawless in his eyes. Our faith in this guarantees us, our faith, look at the word, guarantees us permanent access. Permanent. You know, first, I didn't know these things. This time, when I'm praying, I don't need to go to protocol. I just I say what I want. Straight away. I demand this. That's all. In the name of Jesus. Amen. That's it. You are speaking tongues. I'm speaking tongues over it. I don't need to go through. You are the big of the big. Look, God is not sentimental. God does not need his ego to be massaged. Human beings need that. God does not. Look, God knows. God is confident in himself. God is confident in himself. God doesn't need your acclamation. He knows himself. He said he knows man, that he doesn't commit himself to man. So it's not the bigger of the biggest. Oh, you are the fatter of the fattest. That you are trying to do so that God will, like you think that he, he by that God will sit well. Then he can give you what you want. No. No. Say what you want. Be specific what you want. Don't beat about the bush. Prayer is not trying to convince God because he knows all things. Prayer is taking authority. He wants you to say it because he, wants to he doesn't want to force it on you. So you say your desires. He backs you. So it's not about trying to explain things. Oh, God, you know that you say I've not been praying of late and you know God, I've not. No, that, that, yeah, 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 yeah. He calls that vain repetitions. Say what you want and continue with what you are doing. Look at Jesus in front of the tomb of Lazarus. He didn't explain, oh God, look at Lazarus, you know, four days he's dead and gone. Oh no, Father, I thank you that you hear me always. Lazarus, come forth, end of story. To the blind, to the deaf, put his ring, yes. Ephrata, open, no big deal. Somebody say, hey, but if I'm doing it, it's not working, you see? <laughs> you see, because you want to put an emotional spin on it. You want to put an emotional spin. Our faith guarantees us permanent access. Did you see that? Ah, no, 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 no. Aya boka taya baya. Aya ya ya kosika ya ndola baya. I need interpretation to that. Our faith guarantees us. It, please, it's not faith as an emotion, as a tool. No, our faith in his faithfulness guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us perfect relationship with God. 
when you know this, the next sentence comes. What incredible joy. Best forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. Malala. I can wake up in the morning. Mazukataya. Money in the bank or no money in the bank. Kaya Bosotaya. Mercedes Benz or no Mercedes Benz. This is the greatest relationship. Mazuka. I am grateful. I can jump up and down. I can run. Agaliu. And Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. If you understand this. Because I have authority on planet Earth. If things are not working well, I don't need to cry. I open my mouth and I stop it. That's the relationship we have. And heaven backs it. Don't be sentimental. Don't say in the name of Jesus and want to feel whether has, is it working. No. This is what we have, guys. This is what we have. If we realize that things are not going on well in the business, command. Command, call the customers. Didn't Jesus stop the winds? He was giving us the example of a power over the forces of nature. Command situation to be arranged and let the customers come. Why are you? Why are you? He has given you authority. If the marriage is not working, deal with the spirit behind it. You don't need to cry. If the money is not coming, command Satan's off your finances. Command Satan's hand off your finances. Command the finances to come. Angels will still be on assignment. Quick. If the man is not coming, call him. If the man is not seeing you, command and remove the blindfold. Let him see you. Make it tired. Not as forcing his will. If you detect that something is abnormal, that is what we have. Verse 3. But that's not all. That's what he's even coming to say. Even in times of trouble, trouble, we have a joyful confidence knowing that our pressures will develop us in patient endurance because of what we have in him. Does it matter what is going on? He's letting you know that your status is higher than this. Some believers have this impression that life is a bed of roses. You are mistaken. He said, Persecution ariseth because of the word. Because the word is the only thing Satan fears. That's what Jesus used against him in Luke chapter 4. It is written. It is written. It is written. End of story. And patient endurance. When you understand what he started from verse 1, we we'll refine our character. And proving character leads us back to hope. That means when something happens, mazuka baya, oh, excellent. They, I mean, they say there's trouble. No problem. Let us see which in authority. I will go to bed early and rise up in the morning. And I will be in my living room, me and that situation. Let us see who is in authority. Then I will start. Rabaka katuka bata, meketa yaba, ayaba, the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous makes power available. As I speak in tongues, power develops. Let's see whose power is stronger. And I speak in that power. I command that situation out. So when situation said, it develops, it refines our character in Christ. In other words, it let us define our boundary that, hey, problem, you have come to the wrong person. You have come to the wrong person. My realm is different. So let me define my character to you. And proving character, proving character, you have proved, you have walked in this, leads us back to hope. <laughs> we have this hope as an anchor, which has entered behind the veil. Jesus, our forerunner. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless, do you see that? Endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So because God cannot wait for your love, and because he finds you very important, if he waits for your love, it will be too late. So God cascaded his love inside you, poured it, so that he loves you through his own love. <laughs> Nothing you do will change his mind. For when the time, what, so what is he? What argument is he developing? He's developing the argument for you to see that the life in Christ is 
higher, extraterrestrially higher than the sin of Adam. We have preached it the other way. We have magnified the sin of Adam and sins above the operation of grace. For when the time was right, the anointed one came and died to demonstrate his love for sinners. So he's letting us know that, you see, when we say Christ loves you, it is not sentimental. Me, Kabo Zatai, don't you understand? It is a decision. God decided that before the foundations of the world. It's not subject to time, change, environment, feeling, sentiments, perspective. No, 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 no. It is a rock bottom robust. Now, now I, I'm using the word decision because we are humans. I, I, I even eliminate the word decision. It's not a decision. A decision means that it's subject to change. It is an unreserved nature. God's love is nature. That is how he, he cannot do otherwise. So he, so he demonstrates, that word demonstrates. Can you see that it's in italics? Can you see, that means that the translators were struggling to what kind of register of language they can put into this. So the best they can use the word demonstrate. I will remove that word demonstrate. It is not a demonstration. It is an emphatic nature. His love for sinners who were entirely helpless, weak and powerless to save themselves. Now, who, would, or who, who of us would dare to die for the sake of a person? We cannot understand if someone is willing to die for a truly noble person. But Christ proved God's passionate love. The absence of that love is what is wrongly translated as the wrath of God. For us, by dying in our place, while we're still lost and ungodly. Let me end with verse 9. Look at how he wrote it. And there is still much more to say of this unfailing love for us. For through the blood of Jesus, you have heard the powerful declaration. You are now righteous in my sight. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, hey, hey, Mokotobo, Yebo Zataka Yabadeya, hey, Lebrosaya, since the day you received Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God. Wait! Before I end, did you notice that before he used the word wrath of God, he spoke of love? What is the cascading love? The sacrifice and the payment of the death of Christ. Watch. So which means that in proper theological concept, concept the wrath of God is the absence of the sacrifice of Christ. <laughs> That means the unbeliever, this is made available to him, but he did not take it. That is the wrath of God. Not that God is angry with anybody. The provision was not taken. He said, and because you have accepted it, you will never... Agree. And what, when you accept, what have you come into? The nature of his love. You will never experience the wrath of God. Bigger than the sin of Adam. In Jesus' name, we shall continue tomorrow. Amen. Glory. Praise God. I want to remind you that we have our question and answer on Friday. Today we'll have a panel. On Friday we'll have a panel again. Pastor Gabriel and I will be here to deal with a, another question that has come forward. But if, quickly, because of that, I don't want to extend questions, but I could allow just for a quick, if somebody has got one quick question, if you, if you don't have anything, then we shall, we shall call it a day. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Please, I have a question. Please, flow. Um, Gentiles. Yes. Where do you come from? <laughs> okay. Why Gentiles. Okay. So, um, Gentiles is just a word that means all nations outside Israel. All nations. It was used in the Old Testament. All nations outside Israel. And what was the demarcation point? Because Israel was separated because of the rights or the ritual of circumcision. So it was, it was just an attempt to separate, when we say Israel, then all other nations that, were, that are outside Israel are known as the Gentiles. But we can also, it is also used in an in, in, in English register loosely, loosely to mean anybody who has not believed on Christ. You know? okay. So the Greek, the Hebrew word is mayim. 
nations outside Israel. But we are all of Adam. We are all under Adam, or we come from different. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we are all from Adam, but by reason of the promise, he just wanted to separate that the nation, the nation that responded to the promise in a type. So he 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 separated them because of the coming of Christ, the Messiah. He separated them with a ceremony of circumcision. See? See that? That's why when in Paul's writing, he said that I'm um, a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day. That was the distinguishing mark. All other nations did not have that practice because the promise did not come from any of their four. No, we came from Adam. He separated them in that regard. The reason we did that was that to show that a time will come that it will be the same thing. Either you believe on Christ or you don't believe on Christ. If you believe on Christ, you are in the fold. If you don't believe on Christ, you are considered an unbeliever. So it is for a sake of believing and not believing. That is right. And that's the same thing that, happen, that happens on the day of judgment. What is, the, what, is the, what is the division line? They did not believe on the sacrifice of Christ. You believed on the sacrifice of Christ. That's the separation point. So it is just a time to use, to just separate those who have believed the message in a type in typologies under the Old Testament, and those nations who were not open to it. That is all. So even though we all come from Adam, yes, but not everybody believes on Christ. So if you don't believe on Christ, you're on the other side. If you believe on Christ, you're on this side. So a Gentile is not an innate something. No, no, it's just a language to be able to, to distinguish the promise, those who are enjoying the promise from those who don't enjoy the promise, those who respond. That's all. Yeah? It is well. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Another quick question, Pastor. Okay, rapido, <laughs> rapidamente. <laughs> <laughs> so when we talk about, obviously you've um, spent quite a number of weeks um, talking about this forgiveness um, thing. So if that is the case, then why is it that we've been told again, and also the Bible says, it's not all that call me Lord, Lord, who enter into the kingdom of God. So um, from what the word of God as well, it's not all that started that would end well. So how, where, where is the place for that? Because if we're saying, okay, we'll, uh, we're born again, our sins have been forgiven, and we don't need to be asking forgiveness all the time. And then how come then some people will not get it? to heaven or make the kingdom of God, even though they are believers, even though some might even be pastors, men of God, but then miss it along the line. I don't know if you understand my question. Okay, very good question. It's a question that is asked all the time. So let us just give the answer very soon. First of all, if you have followed the teaching, we have shown you the different dispensations regarding forgiveness of sins. There was a period when there was no law we know that Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus chapter 12, there was a period of the law, Exodus chapter 12 to the end of Malachi. There was a period also of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which also is still an extension of the law. So by the time of Jesus' time, the law was still in operation. Number two, when any statement is made, there is something we call single mention. Then we have got double mention. Then we have got emphatic mention. And we said, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So when we go into the Gospels, Jesus made that statement only once. Only once. Number three, there's also something we call contextual application. Context. So for us to take that verse out and say it means that a person can lose salvation, what we need to do is that we need to go back to the verses before and the chapter before and find out what was the conversation that led to that statement. Number four, remember that at that time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus had not yet died and he had not yet gone to the cross. So straight away, that statement is not even referring to the born again man. So if you watch the context of the statement, Jesus was addressing false teachers in the day. Why? Because he is saying that in Luke 24, all the statements of the prophets, the writings of Moses and the writings of the prophets and the Psalms, which was part of their Jewish system, was pointing to him Christ. But these 
These false teachers, the word false teacher has to do with a message which has been misrepresented. These teachers were making it sound different from how Jesus had come to explain to them. So if you go very further down in that same verse, he said something. He said that, that I would say that depart from me for I did not know you, you workers of iniquity. The question you need to ask yourself is this. Is, and even though believers were not there at that time, the believer is never known as the worker of iniquity. Number five, the next is that he said, I did not know you. So we need to follow that word and track it. John 17, he said that for to know you is eternal life. So to know him is to receive salvation. So that statement, not everyone that calls me Lord, Lord, is not talking about the fact that you are going to lose your salvation. Not at all. That's not the context of that conversation. What he was just trying to say was that, that in, if you guys want us to deal with this matter of people being accepted in your relationship with God, then you have to know that that will be available after resurrection. That will be available after resurrection. Because that was the context he was talking about. So it was not referring to salvation per se. It was referring to how the message of the coming Messiah had been misrepresented. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees were priding themselves in it and pointing people to doze them. Okay. okay. So the word Lord, Lord there, the word Lord, Lord there also needs to be qualified. Because oh. in Hebrew tradition, in the case of the Apostle Paul, in, on the road to Damascus, he said, who are you, Lord? He was not referring to Jesus as Lord and Master. The word Lord is in today's vernacular English, which means sir. Oh, sir. Oh, oh. It's a language of respect. Sir. Yeah. I don't know you, sir. So it's not Lord Jesus. Oh, oh. So that statement, first of all, as a single mention, cannot qualify to be a doctrine. As a yardstick to say somebody can lose their salvation. No. It didn't refer to that at all. And once again, where's the problem? We have taken that verse out of its setting, yeah. away from that chapter, away from the chapter before, away from the chapter after, and make it sound as something. All the, all the statements of Jesus and the parables, we call it in literature, an heuristic statement, which means that he just spoke to arouse their curiosity, but his idea was pointing to the fact that I am the salvation that will be available when I die and I resurrect. But they couldn't catch it. Mm. Okay. So he's letting them know that in those days, you know, you know, he blasted them. He said, these guys, you like to wear long gowns and make your face solemn and let people pass and you stand in the corner of the street. Then they bow to you, Lord, Lord. <laughs> you know, you, you know that thing, hey, 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 Pope, Bishop, Bishop, you know, it's like, as if by doing that and seeing the high priest Caiaphas and others and doing Lord, Lord, then you think that you are, because they were priding themselves mm. in the fact that they were the ones who were the custodians of the law. Hmm. So if you come to me, don't we see that today, Sister Sherry? Yeah, yeah we see that. Mm -hmm. If you don't come to me and give me a dangerous seed, your mm -hmm. heavens will not be open. No. Mm -hmm. So it is a verse taken out of context. The epistles emphatically clear out more than two or three times that salvation is eternal. So that is not referring to that at, at, at all, not at all. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. God bless. Bless, 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 bless. All right. I think we have overstayed our welcome. <laughs> Somebody was saying, you know, I love you all the love. We are going to continue on this, but it's good. I like the way you keep on coming. You're going to learn. You're going to learn. You're going to learn. Let me take this opportunity. And also, I salute my own bosom brother and bishop in ministry as well, our Dr. Apostle Gabriel Opeke. Thank you, sir. I salute you, sir. Thank you very much. I celebrate and salute you for your time. Very, very busy schedule all the way from Nigeria, but yet you found time in your busy practice as a medical doctor to come and see this. Thank you so much. That I find that as an honor. Bless you. Thank you also, Sister Sherry. Thank you, Sister Vivian. Thank you also, Pastor Fodjo, who was there. I think there were others that were there also. Thank you, Brother Elisha. Thank you, Sister Ruth. Thank you, Sister Angela. Thank you, Sister Jennifer. Thank you, Sister Alberta. We love you all with the love of Christ. We are back again tomorrow in our prayer meeting tonight. Bye, bye, bye for now. Bye, 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 bye.